Okay, so just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Suchita. I'm the co-founder of LBB. Uh, today, the only role I will play is that of the moderator. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, share a couple of uh, dad jokes with you guys as we go along over the next hour. Um, uh, so, so, so that that's me. I'm just going to be moderating today. Uh, the actual, uh, you know, heavy lifting of the conversation will be done by my colleagues. Uh, there's Abhijit, um, uh, who essentially leads brand solutions for us, and he works with a lot of our ad brand partners. Uh, he's going to bring a perspective in terms of you know what he's seen from the advertising space. Uh, there's Tanvi, who leads brand marketing for us, uh, and uh, she's essentially responsible for LBB working on our own social media and our own channels and platforms and making them as engaging as is possible. So she will share insights and inputs from what we've seen um, on LBB itself. Uh, there's Akanksha who leads all of content and content ops for us. Um, and she's going to be, you know, giving you a couple of insights and behind the scenes on what she's seen happen on our webinar app as far as user consumption is concerned. And there's Akshita who leads merchant onboarding and merchant growth. Uh, and she's going to be responsible uh, in today's chat to basically tell you about new brands that are launching, interesting campaigns that are being run by a lot of, you know, emerging brands uh, in India. And that's essentially uh, you know the scope of it um so guys when we put together our 2021 consumer and marketing trends report our uh, our endeavor was just one right uh, all of you guys who are either brand marketers brand owners or entrepreneurs you know or are leading marketing etc at different companies uh, we want you to have access to the a to z of what we think consumers are going to be doubling down on this year and also what platforms and products are going to be doubling down on this year uh, very simply uh, you know, uh, uh, as far as LBB is concerned, we totally understand that 2020 was a bit of a wash, right? I mean, not 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 the best year that we've uh, experienced so far. But what was interesting about 2020? What was interesting about um, you know, lockdown uh, and then life post lockdown uh, is that it's led to a lot of permanent and semi permanent changes as far as the Indian consumer is concerned and also as far as the Indian merchant is concerned. So, two big things have happened. SMEs have finally woken up, right? Everyone has realized the importance of having some amount of digital presence and some amount of online presence. And they're actually tapping in to make sure as much of their catalog, you know, their, their inventory, et cetera, is accessible to users online, which has been fairly interesting for us to see uh, on LBB. Uh, it's also led to a lot of changes as far as marketing is concerned for large brands, which we'll tap into in the latter half of today's conversation. On the consumer front, obviously, you know, consumers have been uh, working from home. Consumers have been stuck at home attending Zoom calls, much like the one that we are attending uh, right now. Uh, we've also seen a very interesting shift of consumers from categories like fashion, more so the categories like home decor. So we're going to talk to you about that today as well. Uh, all in all, uh, last year was tough, uh, but we do hope uh, that, you know, um, all the positives that came out of last year, which is an increase in digital digitization for SMEs um large brands, uh, you know, are going out of more traditional methods of customer acquisition and experimenting with newer methods of customer acquisition. Uh, we hope these two big ones are here to stay. Uh, and we do hope the consumer, uh, you know, who is sort of excited by this message of vocal for local continues uh, to shop locally and, and you know, and, and shop from interesting and emerging brands. So I'm going to start with, first and foremost, the category trends, right? Uh, the most interesting category trend, uh, and, and actually one of the more interesting categories has been fashion, which is kind of seen a bit of a haul uh, in terms of, you know, how consumers think about fashion and where they want to spend their, you know, uh, uh, hard earned money in terms of, you know, the things that they want to uh, acquire and the things that they want to spend money on. I'm going to pull in my colleague, Akanksha, who, you know, as I said, heads content ops for us. Uh, Akanksha, what did you see in 2020 last year, which was actually super interesting uh, and which you see sort of percolating into, you know, key consumer trends in 2021? I think to start with the first, uh, you can see on that slide, the guide to the best vintage and thrift shopping. That was one of our best sellers for the entire year. And while India is not really a stranger to any sort of hand-me-down outfits or sort of a thing, it was really no surprise that when uh, Vocal for Local sort of began to trend, that thrift shopping and the vintage boom began. It was not, it, it started with the sort of consciousness for the planet and slow fashion, but then it also evolved into when in a year where people had uh, cutbacks, salary cuts, all those sort of things, it grew into a price conscious sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, space as well. 
So I think uh, people were a little bit sensitive about where they spent their money. If it was something that they would use on a regular basis, they would definitely um, go out and purchase it. But when it became something that they had to, uh, you know, it wasn't something they needed on a much more frequent basis. It became something that they would turn to thrift shopping, vintage shopping. And that also led to uh, conscious shopping, which meant that they would want premium quality over fast moving fashion. And this wasn't only for women. This held true even for men's which diversified from just being shirts and tees into being hybrid, kurta shirts, athleisure and variety of colors. Prints came in hugely. And I think so the thrift shopping, vintage shopping and conscious shopping all merged into one. And we saw that trend come up a lot in 2020. And I think um, Akshita will elaborate on how she sees that coming forward as well. Uh, and I think and just a quick another... question over there, right? So yeah. you brought up this really interesting point about like Indian prints, uh, you know, sort of being uh, dominating the landscape, whether it's for women's wear or men's wear. Uh, any interesting examples uh, that you saw any brands that you want to give a shout out to who've actually done a great job of capturing this trend? I think for the uh, for the local brands, I think Akshita will be the better person to do that. But places like uh, m and H&M, Zara, all brought in Indian prints. And it wasn't just for, obviously, Zara, uh, H&M don't do very Indian um, outfits as well. But they, it was interesting to see how they used Indian prints on non-Indian products. So whether it was dresses, jackets, uh, trousers, palazzos, you saw it on everything. It was that sort of pop of color and prints that dominated across the board. Another really interesting thing that happened in 2020 was, you know, millennials either became pet parents, plant parents, or like actually got knocked up, right? Um, uh, and uh, congratulations, Virat and Anushka. Uh, but but another trend that we saw sort of pick up was this whole maternity wear, you know, situation, right? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I think one interesting thing that we saw even until maybe 2020, to the in the beginning of 2020, perhaps uh, late 2019, in India, especially, it was hide the bump, just hide the bump one way or the other. But I think last year, slowly, it started becoming more about women, uh, millennial mums who didn't stop going to work, who continued to live their lives. And they sort of wanted to just be themselves, body conscious. Um, they were much more body positive and were not conscious about showing their bump. And I think because of that, it led to a very interesting change in how people looked towards maternity wear and a fair number of brands uh, did crop up. I think people highlighted West Side, uh, again H&M, all of them highlighted their maternity sections. So I think that was very interesting. That also in a, a sort of supplement to that was uh, kids fashion. This whole concept of uh, mommy and kids, uh, you know, wearing the same things, twinning, all that thing, all of that came back. And what we saw was again a shift from ethnic and usual outfits to much more contemporary, comfortable stuff. Got it. Akshita, I want to pull you in because, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, one sort of, you know, prediction that we made, uh, even when we were thinking of our merchandising roster for 2021, is just how multifunctional fashion is becoming. Uh, so talk a little bit about, you know, what is the psychology of this user? Uh, you know, what are the specific items where you see them really spending money? Uh, and if you had, uh, you know, a crore to invest in a apparel business, right? Uh, what subcategory or category of apparel or even fashion for that matter would you pick up? Um, so, uh, you know, so in 2020, people got used to just being at home, uh, be it work, be it uh, the lockdown. So comfort really became the top priority as far as fashion was concerned, right? Uh, so uh, talking about multifunctional, so multifunctional fashion, be it clothes or footwear, is what people started looking for and uh, we saw that on our platform we saw that with uh, you know other brands the kind of collections that were coming out so silhouettes that are professional for office uh, stretchy enough for your yoga mat or comfy enough for the couch were uh, you know the kind of silhouettes that uh, people were looking for and people were buying uh, Pinterest calls it at flow, which is at leisure meeting elegance. Uh, but what I'm getting to is that, you know, anything flowy, so be it flowy pants, casual jumpsuits, oversized outfits, anti-fits uh, really became the new, uh, you know, go-to loungewear. And uh, we saw this uh, with respect to shop on LBB also. A lot of brands uh, started sending collections of, you know, multifunctional outfits uh, and footwear, but uh, the point here is it was all with an Indian twist, uh, which Akanksha mentioned. So be it men's or women's. Uh, so think of like midi dresses with Ajrak prints uh, by uh, one of our really favorite brands called Raslila or 
I don't know if you guys have heard of this brand, but uh, this upcoming brand called Rare Rabbit, uh, they've introduced this new range of, you know, uh, go-to loungewear for men. Uh, they're doing uh, ikat printed denim joggers. So, uh, so interesting stuff coming up. But the point being is, uh, I think multifunctional is where the investment is happening. That's what we've seen with brands. So it's multifunctional clothes or footwear along with Indian prints. Uh, that's my take for 2021. Uh, uh, this is just a quick mood board of you know what we expect to happen in 2021 again touching upon all the topics that Akshita mentioned I want to get into home which uh, anyone who follows me on Instagram or you know uh, anyone who looks at my shopping history on shop on LVV knows is my single most favorite category uh, so Akanksha was I the only one who went broke in 2020 because of spending too much money on home decor or do I have other companions in this as well you have a lot of companions in this though you're you're cut above everyone else I think <laughs> <laughs> so I think because people are spending so much time at home we saw perhaps what would have been focused on fashion and apparel for going out shifting towards the home people were trying to make their homes the place because they were spending so much time in it um, in the beginning half of the year we saw everything that was very much more functional so your comfortable office chairs your lamps to light up a desk desks themselves laptop desks that sort of dominated and it seemed like it would be the end of it because once you set up your office uh, uh, office at home we thought that would be the end of it but it suddenly sometime around May June it picked up and then it moved away from the functional stuff to much more vibrant accessories and things that were well beyond what you would traditionally call just furniture diversity within home uh, home decor became an actual thing it ceased to be functional at all um, and I think while you know Pinterest has been saying that this whole Scandinavian look is going to be dominating and while that may be true, perhaps in the Western regions, I think what is really going to trend in India is the other one, the other trend, which is granny chic or grand millennial, which sees, you know, lots of pops of color, accents, in not monotone. So, you know, not, nobody was looking for a single or dual tone anything, whether it was couch or uh, couches or any of their decor. It was much more, think Chumbak, you know, Chumbak actually brought out this style of having mismatched but very interesting and personality driven uh, home accessories so bamboo cane baskets trays anything that nani had in her house is coming back into fashion absolutely and i think what you brought up is so interesting because historically speaking home decor has unfortunately or actually by design always been one of those categories that's been unbranded to a large extent right like you said you know uh, at least from a delhi perspective you've got your kirti nagar where you go to for furnishing you know you've got your halls rani where you go to pick up your you know uh, pots and uh, planters but now there are brands coming into everything uh, akshita when you think of uh, you know uh, this individuality that's almost come up within home decor um, uh, what comes to your mind? What is really driving this millennial, you know, Indian customer vis-a-vis uh, -vis where they want to spend their money when it comes to their home? Um, you know, so uh, Instagram has given everyone their own personality type. So now uh, no one's anymore, uh, you know, sort of tied to what should look like a perfect home setting. Uh, and we've seen this on uh, LBB as well. So the trend uh, you know uh, that's going to be dominating 2021 according to me is the whole mix and match trend uh, so we see a lot of home accessories move on lbb shops so be it cushions be it uh, wall art clocks candles dream catchers i mean what akanksha said right everyone wants to you know sort of reinvent their corner they want to uh, buy stuff which is easy to fix they can play around with I think fast home decor would be a big, big trend in 2021. And we've seen this with, uh, you know, merchants that have come on shop on LBB. So be it Vicar Home Accessories from Opaque Studio or Macrame Wall Hangings by Macrame Corridor, Pendant Lights, another super interesting category, uh, you know, that we've seen move on our platform, uh, you know, by brands such as Earth Heart, Lafayette Lights, Rugs uh, by the Rug Story. So I think all of these accessories combined together is something that's uh, going to be trending in 2021.
So basically, if you're a home decor brand, you know, think outside of just the confines of uh, furniture and really think into, you know, and, and, and think through what the, uh, you know, quicker sort of moving consumption items can be for you. I want to sort of, you know, jump into now beauty and personal care, right? Uh, uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, given that non-essentials were banned up till June, um, I don't know about you guys, but I tried everything from putting wheat on my upper lip for self-care to, you know, suddenly finding a newfound interest in a, you know, chumpy massage which you know you you you're, you're really not that used to so uh, as as a customer who genuinely doesn't give a shit about beauty or self care as you can tell um i uh, you know found myself actually really investing in self care for a change um so and akanksha you mentioned you know in your top recommendations of 2020 you mentioned how um again not just me but this millennial customer uh, you know um, a little worried about going to a salon or a parlor so, sort of took matters into their own hand and you know figure their own routine out so talk to me a little bit about that yeah so clearly you're the trend setter that's exactly what happened right <laughs> di di was everything this year and um, i think what was very interesting to see was people like you said people were too afraid to go out so everything came back into the house and this was it was it was an interesting mix to see how everything that is very traditionally indian including the ingredients the methodology met somewhere along the way met very high tech so on the one hand you would be happy to be using indian ingredients to sort of use as a face scrub but then you also saw a lot of tech coming in in terms of hair removal hair styling men's grooming products so it was very interesting to see how um at home everything became the be all and end all of what we saw as um, uh, in the beauty category in fact nika was nika's trend report sort of said that pampering indulgent feel good skin hair and bath and body products dominated and this didn't include only your um, face oils and things like that it also included aromatherapy candles so i think it was it was there was a shift in how you looked at uh, beauty and skin care this year uh 2020 was also the year akshita where we saw a lot of makeup brands come up right uh, which uh, was kind of weird because you know no one was really using makeup thanks to your you know zoom calls and not having to you know go to office or have any external occasions uh, but we saw makeup pick up closer to diwali right when your gifting period etc starts and now obviously you've got everyone from fay beauty to you know uh, uh, nebel to a billion other brands. brands that are out there um what is your take on you know where makeup and indian makeup brands at large uh, are going um so you know it's very strange that uh, india being such a diverse country we were always uh, you know were being sold this one type of skin which was fair uh, but i think now is the time when brands have really started tapping into this whole personalized range of products be it skin be it hair be it body Uh, makeup so as per the vendors report uh, customers are looking for a made for me product which is addressing a personalized need uh, so be inclusive would be sort of my advice to any beauty brand of uh, figuring it out uh, you know or trying to think of products for 2021 uh, and then there are obviously brands like skin craft vedix they are all doing personalized skin care so they'll analyze your skin and then they'll like you know suggest products as per your skin type but in all of this uh, you know a whole personalized range of products uh, customers thanks to the pandemic are also going back to their roots they are very much aware of the kind of ingredients that they want to consume so the whole i support this cause for my own good will be the customer attitude going forward and we've seen that with brands and collaborations uh, you know in 2020 so fab valley india launched this whole india skin care line which was uh, you know focusing on skin care made from all natural ingredients or it was my glam uh, you know doing a collaboration with manish malhotra and surprisingly all the products in that range had ingredients like haldi kesar cinnamon ginger and you know so on and so forth or we also forest essentials come out with the whole artisanal natural makeup line so what i'm getting to is that one is the whole like be inclusive uh, because finally everyone's like acknowledged that in india there are different skin tones different hair types skin types to be catered to but yes a uh, going back to the roots because people have realized the importance of our indian ingredients uh, so yeah uh, we've seen a lot of nostalgic ingredients come back uh, you know uh, in products from various 
Absolutely. In fact, nostalgia really seems to be a theme across the board, right? And it totally makes sense uh, uh, given, you know, the uncertain times. Uh, I think the the millennial customer, especially, that's actually seen the most amount of change over the past, you know, two, three odd decades. You want to hold on to something that feels familiar, right? Uh, and that's where, you know, whether it's the Nani, Ma, Sheik look or it's your Indian prints or fabrics or, you know, your Kumkumadi, Tulsi, Aloe, all of those are making a comeback. Um Let's get into one of my favorite categories, right? Uh, which obviously is snacks and drinks. Uh, Akanksha, this category was super, super interesting in 2020 because everyone either became a Insta chef or became a granola maker or like launched some FMCG company. Uh, so w- what did you see uh, last year? You know, despite all of it, it eventually came down to going back to your roots. So despite it all, you know, I think eventually, like we were just talking, our nostalgia was hugely dominant even in this section. So whether it was the ingredients that were used or the actual products that came out of it, I think eventually what it all boiled down to was nostalgia. So if you look at the snacks, it was all about your makhana, chikis, ampapa, chakalis from across, across the country. And I think this was the year that khakras became cool again. And I think so snacking just turned it, it's flipped back a couple of years. And there you have it. It was all Indian snacks making this huge comeback. And to, uh, to, to know, uh, you know, to talk about your point of everyone being an Instagram chef, I think when everyone was done with the banana bread and the Dalgona coffee, they just wanted to have something easy to do, which is why a lot of um, meal kits, easy, ready to cook stuff came up. Uh, and I don't think that it, it, it wasn't just um, too you know, to make a quick fix. It was just healthy stuff. Slurp Farm, for example, does amazing pancake mixes. And I don't, yes. And I don't think it was just for this year. I think it's something, I mean, I'm sure Akshita will elaborate, but I think these kind of things are here to stay because convenience at the end of the day is what matters. I think it was a great year for Indian alcohol. Goa yeah, had and it a, continues. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Goa had a gin brand coming out every week, I think. <laughs> including one that launched a couple of days ago, which was called Clearly Good Gin. So I think it was very interesting to see how all of this matched up, but with this undertone of everything being healthy. Got it. Got it. That's super interesting. Uh, and obviously, you know, a healthy immunity, uh, that's the term of the day, right? In term of the year, because of course, people are still paranoid about, you know, uh, their health, about COVID. And, and I've also realized how uh, how fleeting, uh, you know, uh, uh, these moments can be, right? And therefore, doubling up on health is important. Uh, Akshita, talk to me about, uh, about this whole supplement space, man, because, uh, you know, on LBB also, uh, similar to uh, with, with every good gin brand coming out there's also a supplement brand sort of launching right we saw everything from power gummies to some uh, you know collagen brand etc launching what's your take on this whole you know supplements vitamin you know immunity etc etc space um so you know like we were discussing i think more than ever people have realized the importance of immunity and just keeping healthy in general be it by consuming healthier products or just taking supplements i was reading this trend report uh, which is called the top five uh, global trends that will shape the food industry in 2021 i was reading uh, that 50 percent of its customers that they surveyed uh, they all uh, you know sort of indicated that uh, they want to, uh, you know, consume food and beverages that inherently contain some ingredients that improve immunity and energy. So there was this whole focus on uh, whether I'm drinking, uh, you know, something like a kombucha, which improves my gut or I'm uh, consuming any food item uh, but immunity is basically at the back of their mind. So uh, immunity strengthening products, including spices. So spices, again, was, uh, you know, something that I read in one of these reports that you, again, want to go back to your roots. So you want ingredients, which your Nanima said, that are good for your gut and just, uh, you know, improve immunity. So such as ginger, turmeric, neem, they all have, you know, come back. Even on LBB shop brands like Chic Nutrix, uh, which do hair and skin tablets. So if you want bouncy, hair if you want clear skin I mean you have a tablet for everything and uh, with slightly bigger brands like an Akiba Superfoods they've come out with weight management shots immunity shots so it's just like a neem shot that you can drink every day uh, and you know uh, and it, and they claim that you know it'll improve your immunity so yeah lots of interesting brands coming out in this space with again Indian ingredients absolutely Tanmay Bhatt in fact on the open house episode also spoke about man matters uh, apple cider vinegar that he's been using uh, you know 
for uh, weight loss and, uh, and weight management um yeah i think uh, i i think this is a good sort of you know summary of of the mood board that at least we expect for 2021 which is healthier drinks more sugar free keto gluten etc alternatives people who thought keto and gluten and you know diabetic friendly was a trend uh, sorry was was a was a niche trend uh, they actually haven't realized how mass and globalized is actually become with consumers becoming you know more particular about what's going into their systems uh, so uh, abhijit tanvi uh, you know one of the larger sort of trends has definitely been this obsession with all things micro influencers right um, uh, and even at lbb we, we we've used micro influencers for ourselves we've used them for our part now brands uh, abhi if i can bring you in uh, let's kick off with you know what were the interesting insights that you saw uh, as far as uh, micro influencers are concerned uh, and i won't see a shift from large guys to the smaller folks uh, but this you know sort of expansion in terms of the influencer pie that brands are now interested in uh, okay so i think uh, brands realize that they don't necessarily have to pay large sums of money to category a influencers with millions of followers to drive value for their products and services and i think that in part happened uh, i think the shift also happened because of covid because of lockdown you know these larger influencers who are majorly in you know bigger cities brands weren't able to sort of uh, you know send out their products and they weren't really available so these micro influencers really became sort of local voice for these brands and i think uh, they realize that uh, you know what they lack in number of followers they definitely make up in the kind of engagement they drive uh, you know not to mention that they can come at a very affordable price and they also retain a user base that sees them as an expert in their respective fields what that does is that it again goes into that loop of driving higher engagement and uh, actually they ended up getting a better value in less amount of money that they spend for their uh, you know products and services absolutely and categories again right because uh, again if you think of you know the influencer landscape obviously food and fashion just by nature of the category end up having the maximum number of influencers but micro influencers have been very interesting in your slightly you know niche categories as well do you want to talk about that yeah definitely uh, i think i think that goes back to that fact that you know the kind of users they have uh you know they see them as an expert so i think brands started reaching out to them especially in the categories categories of say gaming fitness health uh you know beauty uh definitely was their home and uh, accessories i think these were the larger categories that sort of drove a large part of uh, micro influencer trend that we saw in 2020 and i think that uh, these are the few categories that will continue to sort of grow in 2021 as well awesome uh, so tanvi let me pull you in right um, if you had to put on a brand marketer's hat um, you know which uh, which is a role that you serve for lbb uh, what is the use case of micro influencers and what am i substituting when i work when i choose to work with micro influencers uh, you know uh, over something else all right thank you uh, so suchita uh, like uh, i'll just pick up from where uh, you know abhi left right when he said that there is a lot of uh, trust building that happens and there is a lot of social proof that uh, you know micro influencers bring to the table also another thing i would like to mention is that until now it was brands giving a lot of credibility to these micro influencers however moving forward we are i think as brands going to depend on micro influencers to give us a lot of credibility because uh, the three main things uh, you know the main thing that that people usually depend on micro influencers for is one that their uh, content is absolutely authentic second is that you get end up getting a really high engagement and third is that there is a lot of relatability aspect to it right uh, also i mean if you look at if you look at brands like garnier if you look at even uh, the likes of nike amazon uh, there is one person i would like to quote here who is the founder of filter coffee uh, this girl named aditi devra she very well said that we are going to see an increase in demand for the influencer commerce trend uh, which is simply driving letting your influencers drive a lot of traffic to your website uh, like abhi said that there aren't a lot of brands that have huge amount of influencers that they can depend on which is why they often go to micro influencers to drive traffic to their website and i think that is definitely something that we'll see a lot a lot more of moving forward in 2021 absolutely micro influencers almost becoming uh, you know the equivalent of banner ads especially on platforms like instagram and youtube that count on them uh, you know to grow their own reach and you know doubt amount and all of that uh, 
uh, let's segue into community generated content because you know especially now with platforms uh, becoming so like noisy uh, you know um, uh, brands have really started leveraging their you know their user community their evangelists and fans uh, to sort of become their cheerleaders very publicly uh, abhi we worked on a, a bunch of super fun campaigns you know specifically with community generated content for brands like uh, philips uh, you know neutrogena etc so tell our listeners about you know uh, 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 give an example in fact of a, of a really interesting implementation of community generated content yeah uh, i think since the uh, let me just start by saying that you know uh, community generated content has become sort of a key driver for us in the past year i think we have worked in varied categories and different brands when it comes to actually getting uh, you know content out of users and this happened in large part because uh, you know brands have realized that uh, the content is authentic they can use it on their social platforms it just boost conversion uh, and it has a very high trust value with whoever is watching it and uh, in that sense i think one of the larger campaigns that i can talk about is uh, philips which is a consumer durable brand and uh, the idea was to amplify their existing sort of a campaign which was around khushio ki ladi to reach out to people and ask them how they are spreading happiness during diwali and uh, we got almost 5000 plus uh, you know user generated content from uh, lpb community and these uh, content pieces were then sort of used to highlight the brand on social media and we just saw like uh, you know we we saw almost twice the engagement uh, we usually get on a branded post so the fact that it doesn't look branded the fact that it comes from an actual user it just uh, gives it a high trust value it just boosts conversion and those content pieces go a long way in sort of building trust with your audience absolutely and then we we worked on a lot of really interesting campaigns even for ourselves in shop on lbb right where we kind of used you know user generated content um uh, and 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 leverage that to drive better return on on ad spend so when you look ahead right um uh, uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about how you see brands creating ugc mm-hmm. uh so one thing i would definitely this is an observation that we've made right which is i feel the internet is now unbundling into micro communities and i think as a brand it's, it has become important for us to tap into each of those communities while also making sure that we are very you know we are being very relevant and we are we, we are being very relatable right uh a lot of times we see that the whole uh purchase and sell method the traditional uh, way of selling is no more going to work users are going to look at a lot more value that they can get from customers right i would really like to uh, give a brand's example here which is chumba and uh, very well, they had followed this four steps very well which was designing a concept making sure that you know you know what exactly it is that you want out of a particular campaign then going into engaging and amplifying your audience right whenever you are seeking something out of your consumers what is it that you are giving back to them even if they are in the form of reviews make sure you incentivize those reviews right let there be a sort of are you giving them recognition for the review that they have written are you giving them something back in return for the reviews that they have written you know these little things that matter i think chumbak did it very well where they in their diwali and even christmas campaign they asked people to uh, participate in their campaign by uh, designing or styling their different corners of their houses they then took the best of those and then they put them up on their social media platforms and even on our app uh, and our website in fact you know to the point that you made uh, whenever a customer drops a review or you know adds an image they get lbb perks which you know they can use as discounts a second or the third time that they transact so you're totally right where every step of the content creation journey there has to be some carrot right some incentive given for users uh, you know to take it up a notch uh, last two sections of this uh, you know final section um, and the more exciting one is you know finally brands have woken up uh, uh, people are not only investing in long form content but everything from you know reels to short form videos uh, to you know virtual experiences uh, every single possible way of engaging with users is now being tapped into uh, so abhi talk to us a little bit about you know this whole uh, thing of digital events and how you know just when you thought webinars were get getting boring uh, you know you still have users signing up for unique experiences that are digitally enabled so give an example uh, and also you know uh, uh, predict a little bit in terms of where you see 2021 landing up yeah so so i think we started with the uh, you know just uh, 
brands and uh, publishers like us just trying out sort of different formats of uh, getting people uh, online for a live event. Uh, but I think uh, what ended up sort of working was interactive sessions. Uh, so wherever, you know, there was a possibility for users to sort of interact, become part of the conversation, where, wherever they could try out the products, those sort of interactive sessions saw a lot of stickiness. People, uh, you know, stood around for the entirety of the event. Going in 2021, I think uh, interactive sessions will sort of keep on happening until the very end of this year uh, because of the kind of situation we definitely are in. I think one example that really stood out for us this year was obviously the kind of approach we did, but uh, you know how we were able to sort of drive uh, interaction between the brand and the consumers. And that example is of Neutrogena, wherein the idea was to drive sampling, but also get people to sort of try out the product in uh, real time and give a real time feedback. So there was this, uh, this entire event about doing the workshop, which I think a lot of brands did, but I think we figured out that if we were able to send out the samples of Neutrogena to these people who have signed up, I think they'd be more interested in actually trying it out, giving the real time feedback, which the brands can also sort of take back and, you know, uh, build on it. And I think Neutrogena was a great example to not just uh, get people online, get them sort of, uh, you know, uh, be interactive in the session, but also drive sampling. Absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, just taking sampling, which is fairly broken, even from the retail landscape, landscape whether it's, you know, general trade or modern trade, um, and, and enabling that and bringing that online is, is a super interesting phenomena that we saw. Uh, Tandi, now, you know, reels, there's that feel it, reel it, there's, you know, YouTube going into short form video content. Now, obviously, you know, TikTok was banned, but then as a consequence of that, there were 20 other Indian companies that sort of came up. Now, when you think of formats, right, what are the ones that are exciting you, uh, you know, as uh, 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 given that you're a brand marketer as well? Mm -hmm. uh, well, see, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the, a brand has to uh, uh, follow a particular trend. And I would definitely say that, you know, we would not like to steer away from reels or from YouTube. YouTube shorts but uh, at the same time I would like to mention that there are a lot more touch points right apart from social media or apart from a specific platform uh, look at for example the rise of newsletters so many people are now depending on newsletters to uh, you know uh, uh, basically showcase their uh, showcase their content or even as a form of consumption look Look at podcasts, for example. There are so many people starting podcasts. There is so much con there is so much consumption happening on that platform as well. There are LinkedIn stories that are going to now come up. So I think there are a lot of ways in which there is scope for brands to put out content and for them to reach out to their customers on different platforms. Uh, I think uh, definitely like the rise of newsletters, podcasts, uh, even LinkedIn, LinkedIn stories coming up. Uh, that is something that we are definitely looking forward to and, you know, have already rather started making plans in those directions. Kind of like a brand can have, uh, you know, can almost have like a split personality, right? Like you can be a certain type of person on LinkedIn, you can have another personality on, on a podcast and you can have a totally different personality when you're creating reels on Instagram. Uh, and I think the, the, the great thing about that is brands will become more multidimensional uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the clear tenets uh, and the checklist that brands usually operate with. So hopefully there's more flexibility on, on that front as well. Uh, I want to move to the last section, which is content first performance marketing. Um, and, uh, and, and Abhijit, I think, you know, as, as uh, folks like you and me who end up engaging with a lot of brands, talking to a lot of brand managers and brand owners, uh, obviously, when people think of digital, they think of performance, right? And, and in, a, in an age of like Facebook and, uh, and Amazon and Google and, you know, display ads and ROAS on everything, uh, it becomes difficult to break through that clutter up until last year when we actually saw brands use content very intelligently to drive, you know, either leads, transactions or, or whatever you know key metric that they had identified uh, so so you know the, the number that you've given over here is that at lbb we saw 90 percent increase in content-led performance marketing what are brands thinking when they do content-led performance marketing and could you also define what content-led performance marketing is yeah so so i think uh they are so traditionally i think uh, content was always sort of uh, you know uh, connected with driving impressions, especially. And I think that was the game that uh, marketers always sort of played. But with the uh, diminishing marketing budgets, uh, you know, and the need to optimize every single dollar spent, uh, the return from content marketing became uh, focused towards driving revenue, driving ROI, driving people back 
uh, you know, back to websites, driving CTR, and uh, that sort of an approach happened with content. And I think uh, largely LBV has always been a content platform, but uh, I think the conversation last year changed that I do not just want impressions to be sort of sole metric for me to, uh, you know, gauge the performance, but rather I would say how many people have sort of bought the product, how many people have, uh, you know, came back to my website. And I think... Uh, that was a slight, like a big shift that happened, uh, uh, you know, last year. And I think uh, the ability for content to, uh, you know, A, tell a story, B, uh, educate customers to sort of, uh, you know, uh, educate them on the overall product and services. The idea that it also builds trust, the idea that it has a longer shelf life, the idea that it has a sustained traffic all of this sort of comes into play when it comes to content marketing. And that's the reason why this year and going forward, content performance marketing is going to be a huge hit with everybody. All the Ab- Absolutely. And actually, I, what we've seen is some of the more intelligent brands are actually creating content, slicing it into multiple different units and actually pushing, you know, those units out uh, in different directions. An example being, uh, you know, Upgrad, we recently worked on on a couple of campaigns for. So Tanvi, uh, when you look ahead, right, what are, the, what are the categories that you see sort of doubling down on performance on content led uh, performance marketing? Because obviously there are some categories that are naturally very aligned to content creation and there are others say for example like edutech and say auto which may not be right so uh, what are your two cents on you know um, the kind of categories that you see really jump on this uh, you know content led performance marketing trend uh, gaming definitely i uh, definitely i think is one uh, i also uh, i also think uh, to some extent probably uh, you know uh, edutech edutech like you said you already mentioned but to some extent i think beauty will also be one that uh, uh, especially skincare in beauty uh, we might we will be able to see a good rise in that uh, also i think it all circles uh, it all circles back to you know what other uh, moments are also you tapping into right Uh, For example, uh, even something like, I think even entertainment industry for that matter, I mean, and I would like to uh, give Amazon's example over here where they just, uh, you know, remember this whole Rahul Bose moment where a tweet went viral about him mentioning that, you know, a luxury hotel charged him, say, about 440 rupees for a pair of bananas where they just jumped in and said that, oh, really, but Prime membership just charges, like, you know, we just charge you 129 so there are a lot of aspects under, you know, even content-led performance marketing. And I think it highly depends on uh, brands being absolutely alert about what are those moments that they have, they must tap into because this is a gener- like this is the time when everybody wants instant fun, right? It is all about instant consumption. Everything has to happen in real time. We can't wait for, uh, you know, uh, there to be a right time for us. No, absolutely. And and you brought up such a great example on, you know, uh, moment based marketing and just and, and using every content moment, whether it's on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, wherever else and leveraging that to your benefit. Um, so uh, this covers the, you know, more uh, Q, the, the, the more sort of like direct um, uh, uh, presentation part of what we had to cover. Um, I'm going to sort of get into a couple of, you know, questions over here um, and shoot a few questions your way guys uh, uh, all of you on the call uh, who have either just joined us or have been listening to us for a period of time do drop in your questions um, uh, I'll be able to you know uh, make sure that I take them uh, directly I'll just quickly change the settings there we go so keep sending your questions my my way more than happy to take them on so, so Akshita I want to uh, I, 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 I want you to jump in over here because you know uh, through shop on LBB and even through just LBB at large we guys are introduced to new brands every single day right uh, there almost seems like there's 10 new brands coming up every single day um, uh, if, if I gave you like a million dollars right and told you to cut checks to five five brands uh, I know uh, I'm putting you on the spot over here but what are the five brands uh, that you would pick up and and who would you sort of invest in if you had to wear that hat and wear that lens uh, I think Suchita more than brands I would uh, kind of put my monies in certain subcategories as we would like to call it so I think fashion and home uh, are these two categories where I'll probably uh, as like you know larger umbrella categories i'd like to put my monies in and but if i was to talk about fashion uh like i mentioned i, I think indian prints is gonna be my like biggest bet 
uh, with all of those flowy outfits and you know from like bed to desk outfits but yes i think indian prince would be uh, one sort of category that i'll bet on uh, and i think uh, we have some beautiful brands and it'll be unfair to just sort of call out uh, you know one or two brands uh, so i'll stay away from that uh, so uh, that's uh, one sort of category and if i were to talk of home uh i think home accessories definitely home accessories because you've seen the smallest brands come out with accessories uh, during this time and even brands like you know nicobar godot slightly expensive brands but uh, again people are buying ceramics from their table accessories wall accessories so it's all about just revamping reinventing your you know little corners to make it look cozy to make it look work friendly so i think yeah those will be like my biggest two bets Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question now to Tanvi and Akanksha, right? Um, and these questions come uh, from uh, Divya, who's asking, "How do you grow a community uh, of brands, uh, right?" Um, so, for example, uh, and Divya, please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm a brand, how do I grow the community around me, uh, and how do I make sure that you know uh, the, the community that I work with, uh, you know, uh, keep sort of uh, compounding at a certain rate because that's also critical, right? You don't want communities to be niche. Uh, so, Tanvi, um, uh, a SD abhi um, uh, do you guys want to jump in on that question so i think uh, i mean obviously there is a need to sort of grow the communities i think it's important that uh, uh, you know we keep continue growing the consumer base and i'll just give you an example of what mama earth did right they have this huge community of moms that they reach out through whatsapp and i think uh, it's one of a kind of a marketing effort that mama earth brought that really helped them sort of become top of the mind in, especially in their uh, you know core uh target audience and i think the fact that uh, you know they started with only say 1000 moms and now they have a community of 10000 moms i think it speaks volume because i think uh, you know that kind of interest it draws other people in you know especially because a word of mouth marketing goes a long way getting people into the business and getting them interested and i think that, that is one of the ways i mean you have to keep engaging with them you have to keep incentivizing them you have to be genuine with them you have to obviously you have to have a good brand story you need to have a good product like all of those things go but you need to keep engaging with them on a regular basis and i think that will have a compounding effect the yeah, any brought up a really important point which is you know um a community shouldn't only be looked at as a way for you to you know get content or, or whatever else uh, they should actually be looked at to get feedback um and i think that is super super important right because uh, who's best to hold you accountable to your you know values or to your you know true goals uh, than you know your 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 top 1000 fans uh in fact uh, you know um, a16z has this fantastic article uh, uh, i'm just seen in horowitz's uh, newsletter uh, they have this fantastic article on you know uh, the top 1000 fans sort of philosophy so which all of you guys on this call should totally check out uh, tanvi yes anything you'd like to add there No I think Abhi's I think Abhi's covered it but I think the reciprocal thing of it's not that you can look to your community as only as a consumer like you said right I think it's very reciprocative about how you can they can hold you up to those standards that you sort of believe in and then they become the voice of um, they become the face of your brand so I think it's it's something that we try to do at LBB as well uh wherein we have niche groups and we've started our own WhatsApp groups as well and this is a much more direct and um, you know personalized sort of um, a relationship that you can have with your users and consumers which more and more is being called your community rather than actually a consumer or a user absolutely and i think a kangsha just alluded to a really interesting exercise that we did so those of you on the call who are you know brand marketers on lbbb actually uh, you know uh, took um, uh, five of our team members and our editors uh, and we asked our users to sign up to be a part of their whatsapp group so a kangsha in fact has her own whatsapp group uh, and you know once a week she sends out whatsapps in terms of recommendations for you know what 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 uh, what folks uh, what our user community can do and we saw that work really well and in a very interesting way in terms of not just driving you know page views and all of that but also getting user feedback right in terms of what they like and what they don't like uh, i'm going to ask um, uh, akshita you a question now which is you know um, uh, people think uh, you know millennials are like hip and cool and you know are like down to try the coolest d to c brand that's out there uh, but uh, obviously one thing that you know uh, we know for a fact is Uh, millennials which is essentially users who are largely in between about 20 you know 223 all the way up to 35 36 they're actually very 
Chindi. So, um, question, uh, you know, over there, uh, which Niharika has asked as well, which is how much do millennials actually spend? And are they cuffing up big bucks when it comes to things that, you know, uh, uh, interest them? Uh, or uh, or is this user very, very price conscious still? Um, so, interesting question. So, uh, what I would like to add in here is millennials love to spend. And it's great because that's why platforms like us make money. But, you know, I mean, and thank God for that. But yes, they love to spend money, but they would also, they spend money on different things. So to call them chindi, I don't think so. That's the right term because uh, chindi would mean that they spend lesser money. But I think what we've seen work is that they're looking for interesting options to buy so if uh, I were to tell a millennial that, hey, you know, this is like a really cool brand of coffee because um, guess what? You If you post a picture about this coffee on your Instagram uh, and, uh, you know, tag a friend, uh, they'll send that coffee to your friend. So Slay Coffee has recently started doing, uh, you know, gift uh, coffee to your friend. Uh, and every time you order the coffee, you can, uh, you know, gift it to a friend. So uh, I think giving them interesting options is what kind of, uh, you know, gets them to spend money. Uh, they're looking for the next cool thing to buy. So if I were to tell them that, hey, like move away from Skippy peanut butter because I'm going to get you a Happy Jars, uh, original, like only peanut oil, natural butter, they're down to try it. Uh, so I think that whole, uh, you know, the point here being that they want to be cool. Uh, they want to stand out in a certain way. So I think giving them options really helps and they will definitely spend money. Like there's no doubt in that and we've seen that in our categories even in home decor you know i've seen uh, millennials spend a lot of money because they've suddenly found this really cool looking light uh, in the shape of a i don't know in, in, in like a fun like a quirky shape but they're down to try it because it just looks cool it helps them like stand out and makes their home look cool so that would be my take on it millennials do have a higher threshold for trust I think uh, recently I was reading a study where it stated that, and I'm not sure where, how much true it is, but uh, it stated that uh, millennials have less than 1% trust on branded advertisements, yet they are driven to, uh, you know, make better choices when it comes through a form of a recommendation or from a source like uh, influencers whom they can trust. So, I mean, if we give them that opportunity to uh, sort of educate themselves about a new product, I don't think they end up being chindi. I think they end up spending a lot of money. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, you know, this one term uh, that we guys use internally at LVB is this term called accelerated signaling, right? Where uh, in our parents' generation, signaling came from, you know, where you stayed, what car you owned, if you had a fancy watch or not. But, you know, millennial signal bases everything, right? From my ragi pancake in the morning by Slurp Farms to, you know, my coffee from Toffee Coffee Roasters uh, to my earrings from Shop Loon. Uh, anything that you own becomes a way for you to signal that you're aspirational that you know uh, you're, you're you're doing well for yourself or even if the signaling isn't monetary sometimes the signaling uh, is also um uh, to to sort of align yourself with the community right uh, so we see a lot of you know users signal uh, them being interested in health um, you know uh, which obviously isn't tied to a certain dollar purchase but is basically tied to this way of life so a uh, signaling uh, has uh, seriously accelerated and the smallest things from the you know uh, perfume you're wearing to the food you're eating to uh, you know uh, just where you're spending time and you know to the point that Tandi made uh, I mean just just uh, and, and I'm guilty of this but just look at the amount of signaling we all do when we talk about books that we're reading or podcasts that we're listening to right so all of these small objects have become um, a way to signal a uh, last couple of questions that I'm going to take uh, Sarthak um, You've asked, has LDD used platforms like Discord rather than WhatsApp to engage uh, their younger audience? What do you think is the scope of Discord? Uh, I'd actually highly recommend that you listen to the episode um, uh, with Tanmay Bhatt on LDD's open house because he is super, super, super bullish on Discord. Um, he actually showed me Discord for the first time, though I'm obviously familiar with the platform. I haven't, we haven't had a chance to, uh, you know, play around with it. Uh, for LDD, our users slightly older. So our user, you know, uh, typically is 
ages in between 26, 27, all the way up to 35, 36. Um, uh, so we haven't, and Discord, you know, is uh, definitely a platform that taps into your slightly more Gen Z-esque uh, user. So we haven't, uh, you know, uh, tapped into Discord yet, uh, but I do think it is an absolutely fantastic platform, especially after, you know, Tanmay and I sort of ran through how you can create your groups and sub-communities and this side and the other. I think it's an absolutely fantastic platform. Uh, I do think the thing with, you know, um, newer platforms that are coming up, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, Discord or it's Substack or, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or even Clubhouse for that matter, which again operates on this principle of, you know, smaller communities within a larger platform. Uh, I think the integration really has to be as seamless as is possible and i know i'm dropping a lot of you know garbage marketing jingo while uh, you know while i say that but uh, but but the thing with these platforms is you know the thing with clubhouse the thing with Substack or Discord is uh, you cannot push your brand, right? Because the second you start pushing your brand, you're immediately taking away from what that particular product or platform uh, is about. Uh, in fact, uh, actually, I think what would be interesting to see is how a platform like Instagram navigates, uh, you know, um, a brand versus creator versus consumer. Uh, because somewhere there, you know, they've got these three, you know, large communities of um of users using their platform, uh, which is, you know, brands, creators, as well as consumers. Uh, and the lines are sort of blurring everywhere, right? Uh, consumers are becoming creators, creators are becoming brands and vice versa. Um, and I think with, with lines getting more and more blurry, the real question to answer for a lot of brands, us included, is, uh, you know, how do we make sure that we don't only stay top of, top of mind and relevant, but are actually able to add some value to that platform ourselves? So we have an experiment with Discord too much. Uh, to be fair, uh, you know, uh, not entirely um, uh, our, our user base, which is, you know, typically female millennial, uh, isn't necessarily on this platform. So I haven't had a chance to, to you know, play around with that too much. But uh, if you've tried stuff on Discord, do share that with us, man. More than happy to learn from you. Okay, guys, we have crossed our time. Uh, we're at 6.05 now. Uh, we're going to, you know, bid you guys adieu. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope this was super helpful for all of you. Um, uh, if you enjoy the session, give us a shout out on Twitter at from LBB uh, or on Instagram, uh, you know, tag us at um, uh, LBB for business. Sorry, Kanak, I hope I got that uh, correct. Uh, my name is Sujita. My colleagues over here are uh, Akshita, Akanksha, Tanvi, Abhijit. Uh, we've all had an absolutely fabulous time putting together the report for you. Uh, we hope you had a, a great time going through it. Um, if you guys have any questions about the report, uh, you know, you want to bring brainstorm with us, you want to run ideas by us, please reach out to any of us, uh, you know, on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm more than happy to brainstorm with you. If you're a local brand or if you're any brand at all, um, we'd love to hear from you. So, uh, you know, reach out to us. Um, uh, if you go to our website on the top right corner, you'll see a partner with our section and, a you know, merchant.lbb.in page. So reach out to us there. I am pretty accessible. You can reach out to me. I'm on suchita at lbb.in. So anything you need, uh, you know, uh, hit us up uh, more than happy to help you uh, with your uh, you know brand journey and with your brand growth thank you so much 